Yeah. Well, let's start with Green Beer and then we can begin. So we're going to speak about low latency Java systems. So a couple of years ago, before I started my current job, if somebody tell me that I need to speak about low latency, that's not going to happen. But now I need to speak about that. So let's first start by introducing myself. So here, this is me, probably. And currently I'm an architect lead at a company called Nexo. Also, I'm a co-founder and trainer at HackerChat. This is basically my academy. I started a couple of years ago. It's really fun. We teach kids not in Java, but yeah, probably next time. So I'm the Java guy from Plovdiv. Why Plovdiv? Because it's a beautiful city and there is a lot of beers there. As you can see, this is the beer from Plovdiv as well. So uh, if, you, if you want to find me, you can just scan the code and yeah, just ping me a message. Uh, what we're going to talk about so we are going to talk about the low latency, but let's see what the agenda is. So the first question would be, what is low latency system? And why we need that? Do we really need that? And in which cases we care about that? How GVM works? So in order to switch by low latency and understand why we need to use those patterns and how to apply them in the real systems, we need to understand the GVM. So this is the most important part of our work. Everybody uses the GVM, but nobody cares about the objects, the memory location, how the memory is free, and things like that. We need to understand that and start care about that if you want to use Java for low latency systems. The next thing is Java memory model. So yesterday there was an amazing presentation about out-of-memory errors. It was really amazing. So we are going to speak about that, and we are going to use almost the same slides, but we need to to understand them, why we need to care about them in scope of low latency. Right after that, we're going to move about uh, heap memory best practices. Hmm, interesting. What that really mean? What kind of techniques we can use in order to not do so much garbage and basically do a garbage rest code? Right after that, we're going to speak about thread synchronizations. How many of you guys use threads in their application right now? If somebody care about threads? Okay, so you have a big problem then. You need just to remove them. Okay, right after that we are going to speak about something called LMAX Disruptor. It was really as amazing technologies that I really want to use more and more in my current company. So yeah, let's try to adapt that as much as possible. Right after that, we are going to speak about some open source uh, tools and libraries. The first one is called Chronicle Map. The second one is called Chronicle Q. And we are going to try to understand how they are applying those techniques that we are going to discuss before that. Basically, they are building something called Open HFT. But yeah, let's move. Is Java a good choice for low latency programming? That is the main question that we need to answer today. Is it true or false? We are going to see at the end. But that is the main question. Please remember that. Okay, the next one. What is low latency systems? So, low latency systems basically mean the time that is required something to be processed on the system. So, how much is that? We are going to see. Depend of the language, depend of what we want to do. But that is the main question that we need to to understand and basically to understand wha why and to what and how. They optimize for speed. So we need to process a message as fast as possible. If you're not processing as fast as possible, basically we have a problem. So let's speak about time scales. So as you can see, the Java is the, the fastest things, probably. First of all, one thousandth of seconds, it's millisecond. It's really important. Please take a picture from that. The next one, one million of the second is the microsecond. Okay? And the next one would be one billion of the second is nanosecond. So where the Java would be in those metrics, we are going to see in next slides, probably. So let's try to compare some languages. So why we're speaking about Java, not C++ or Python? Really interesting question, probably all of you guys read, write some code in Java, probably. So first, Java is 
about 10 microseconds. So if you want to write a code that could run for 10 microseconds, Java is a good choice. If you need to go lower than that, please don't use Java. With C and C++, you can do almost the same. You need to hire the, one of the best C++ developers in order to go below that. So where is Python? That's a big question. Where is Python in that picture? It's around 50 times slower than Java. So Python is not going to be used for low latency system. Just get and kick. OK. Low latency domains. Why we need to speak about low latency domains and why we care about that? So as you can see here, this is basically crypto chart. And you can see how the prices are moving. So we are speaking about low latency domain when we have high frequency trading. So where, when we do a trading, we need to speak about that. Online gaming. So, and also probably gambling and bidding. So if you bid, you need to be as fast as possible if you want to win or lose. Really depends of your bid, but yeah, we need to be as fast as possible. Vertical autopilot system is something that if there is delay there, something is going to be wrong, probably. Okay. Before we move to the real code and uh, get, get in the examples, we need to understand a couple of uh, important things. First, what is batching? What is the throughput? What is the response time? Why well, I'm going to talk about that. A couple of months ago, I have a meeting with uh, one colleague, and basically he just said, OK, if, you increase, if we decrease the response time, the throughput is going to go up. Hmm, interesting. Is that true? Somebody? Is there some relation between the throughput and the latency and the response time? Probably, but it's not clearly defined. So we are not able to make sentences like that. That is totally wrong. Please don't say something like that in your interview at least. OK, let's try to measure the throughput. The throughput measures the base of the amount of work that can be accomplished in a certain period of time. Well, that could be one second, one minute. Really depends on your application. But yeah, it's basically there is a pipe and how much data could be go to the type for, type for some particular time. OK, how we measure that? We measure that by transaction per seconds. How many transactions per second could be achieved? Request per seconds, it's a good choice for metrics. It really depends what you do. Operation per second. So most of the time, if you want to go as generic as possible, please just use operation per seconds. You need to be really well with that. OK, response time, the next important metric. Ah, right. OK, response time refers to the interval between the initial of the request and the, res and the completion of the response. So basically, send a message and to receive the response back. So we are speaking about the low latency. This should be something low, probably. OK, let's move. Why Java, not some other languages? There's a lot of languages that could do something like that. But why we decide to use Java, and why Java? There is a couple of things. First of all, white ecosystems. We have Spring, we have Quarkus, we have Chronicle, and there are many libraries and tools that are already created for us. We don't need to create them. We can just use them. OK, that is the one of the things that is the important. The next one, amazing community. Look, guys, you are here. It's amazing. There is a beer, coffee, and many talks, and it's a big community. Speed of development. We are Java developers. We can write Java code. There is a lot of speed there, so why not? And most smooth hiring. So if somebody of you tried to hire something that is not Java developer, it's take a lot of time. Last time when I tried to hire the front-end developer, it took me around six months to find somebody. Now it took me around six months to find the architect, but yeah, doesn't really matter. So uh, if you need to hack some with Java, it's going to be a little bit more easy, probably. Or you can just build that guy. Speed of the code. If you write the Java in the good way, the speed is going to be amazing. What are the challenges of using Java for low latency? If there are any challenges, what do we need to do in order to make Java to be uh, compatible for low latency systems? So the one of the most important things is garbage correction. Oh, something that we need to remove as much as possible. 
If you're not, we are going to have a problem. So just get and remove it if it's possible. The next one, WarnUp. If you are not warning our application, it's basically it's not going to perform as much as good as we expect it to be. So we need to warn up our applications. That's a big challenge because you cannot just pass the data that is not good enough. So let's say that you have a crypto exchange and there is a lot of orders in seconds. So in order to warn up that application, you need to send some orders. But if the, those orders are not uh, correct, so basically you're going to execute somebody else's orders. That is not good. So you need to find a way how you can warn up your application somehow. The next thing is unpredictable compilation. So as you know that when, when the bytecode is uh, compiled, there is a JIT and there is a lot of optimization. You basically don't know what the code is running. So something is running that do the job, but what is that? Nobody knows. Don't have control of the memory layout. So as a Java developer, you just create the objects, you just reuse them, you just do some kind of good uh, practices and things like that, but we don't have a control of the memory. So the, we don't have control of heap. If you need to get a control of heap, just don't use heap, just go off heap and use some native memory. Unsafe. Okay. Let's try to understand how to mitigate some of those challenges. So let's try to see what we can do as a Java developers without too much control to solve some of those challenges. First, let's understand how JVM works. Okay, so just in time comp compression, let's st start with the overview. What are the steps? First, there is something that interpreted our code, do some kind of profiling, and we are ready to run. After that, there are a couple of more steps when the code is in interpreted by the GVM. So first, there is a C1 compiler. That is really fast. Just get the code quickly, execute it quickly, do some kind of optimizations, but if those optimizations are good enough, we don't know. That is the first run, so we are going to see. Right after that, when the C1 is done, it's basically take some of the code and put it in the code cache. It's basically going to use for the next iteration. There is a step here that probably could do some kind of inline, get your getter and just put it somewhere, remove the getters and things like that because this is extra invocation. And the C1 is doing something like that. Okay, right after that, there is a C2, which basically do a little bit more optimizations. But why is the second step? Because it's slower. C2 is a little bit slower than C1, but do better optimization, probably. Right after that, C2 is already have a cache, could, could, could communicate with it, could put some debt there. Okay. But right after that, is that a good enough? If you just finish here? Mm, probably no. We are not exactly sure what C2 really do. Could remove some code that is uh, used, but Basically, the optimization in that moment is not. So there is a phrase called de-optimization. It's basically restart the cycle and start doing that. That is the, one of the reasons why we need to warn up our application a little bit more in order to prepare the GVM and all, the, all those uh, optimization to be done, to be corrected for us and just to use them. Okay, let's move. How many of you guys have something like that in production? Nobody? Really? Nobody if you use concatenation in the string when doing the working? Guys, don't be shy. Okay. Are there any problems here? How many? Okay. Couple of problems. First of all, the concatenation. So we basically allocate the memory for that string, but also we are doing convocation to get number of participants in the J prime. So yeah, we need to try to just not do it. How we can solve that? We can solve that with something like that. First, there is a if that basically check if the work level is fine for that particular class. And right after that, we can wrap the worker. At some point, C2 is going to decide for us 
that just going to remove that line. It's not going to do any kind of invocation, at least in the first run. So it's basically we're going to have a good speed. That basically happens when you have the bug. The bug basically there is invocation. Every invocation is going to slow down your application. Pretty try to just not do that. OK, let's move registers and main memory. OK, uh, there is an example here. It's a register test. If we want to be as fast as possible, we need to take the data not from the main memory. We need to take the data from register on the CPU, or at least in the cache. Let's try to compare the time that is required for the Java to take the data from the main memory, L1, L2, or L3 cache, and the register. As you can see here, if the data is inside the register, there is uh, only one cycle of the CPU to take the data. If the data is in the main memory, you can see that there is at least 60 nanoseconds just to fetch the data. So if you want to write the code that is, is going to be low latency, you need to take care of that data and try to handle as much as possible data inside the L2 and L3 cache. How does Java memory model, model really work? Beer, then coffee, and we can continue. OK, so uh, there is two sections, heap and not heap. What we have inside the heap? We have young generation and old generation. So what basically happens when you do a new object? It's basically going to put that inside the young generation. Right after that, in a couple of iterations, it's going to move that object from young generation, either from survivor, survivor, and right after that to the old generation. So we need to try to create the objects and keep them as much as possible inside the young generation. If we move into the old, it's going to happen something like stop the world. And when something like that happens in the low latency application, there is a big problem. OK, let's move on the non-heap side. We have metadata, threads, code cache, and garbage correction. OK, not interesting here. But we know where the data is. That is the most important takeaway from this slide. Heap memory best practices. OK, now is the part when we are going to start to learn how we are going to use good practices to optimize the heap and not to create too much objects, try to reuse them, try to just get them read so fast. So first, using less memory. That is the most common way how you can reduce the heap. Just create the objects that are uh, a little bit more smaller. OK. Efficient. No problem at all. But how we can do that? The first way to do that is just to reducing the object size. Try to create the objects that use as less memory as possible. Use something like byte if there is no much data. Don't use int because it's taking more size. Try to do that. Try to take care about the data size. Also, when there is a reference, this basically means 8 bits. So, no. If you have something like that, you can try to calculate how many bits are required for every of those classes. And right after that, you're going to take to decide to not use some of them. Probably C is not the good choice. OK, let's move. Using lazy initialization. So, Let's say that when we call the calendar get instance, it's going to take a lot of time. But if you have an application, as you can think, probably you are going to reuse that. You're going to create it only once and reuse it almost in the entire application. You don't need to create it many times. But do I need to create it when the object is initialized? Not really. I'm going to create that when it's required to be created. OK, let's move using immutable objects. So there is many immutable objects in Java, as integer, double, boolean, or some others like big decimal. So there is a, a good story about big decimal in two months ago. So one of my colleagues just changed the implementation of uh, one class and started using big decimal. Right after that, two minutes, when we deploy application production, there is a it's basically, there is a heap error. 
out of memory. So you need to start care when, when to use uh, those objects, and please just don't use them as probably. Let's see. OK, there is one problem in the JDK. So in the JDK, you can just do new Boolean of something. Do we really need to do that? Boolean can have only two values, true or false, nothing else. So why there is a constructor there? Nobody knows. Probably they're going to remove it. We can see. If there is uh, objects like that, those objects basically is called canonical version of the object because you have the end representation. You have only two values possible. How you can do that in Java? Let's say that you want to create the objects like that in your old implement in your implementation. So you can do something like that. You can create we cache map with some key. You can decide what the key would be. And also we can reference with the object that you need to be stored. And after that, there is some synchronization. It's really bad. But we are going to discuss that a little bit later, how you can remove that at all. You can just call map get data. It's there. It's not there. Put it there. What that is going to do for us? Let's say that you create a lot of objects. Probably you're creating a lot of orders or uh, a lot of accounts or something like that. You can put them there and just reuse them in the next iteration. And that's going to save a lot of memory for us. Object reuse. There is a two way how you can do object reuse. The first way is using something called object pools. And the second way is uh, thread local. When I speak about the object pools, probably all of you using something like a Hikari pool or something like that, or uh, some kind of uh, HTTP pooling in order to keep the connections. So here's almost the same. We need to have a pool of objects and just reuse them, not to create them every time. But if you think a little bit more, a couple of slides ago, I said that we need to keep the objects in younger generation of the memory. Yeah. It really depends what we want to do. But if we keep them and reuse them and initialize them only once, there is not going to have garbage correction. We don't have any problems. So let's see how we can do that. Object boost code. Let's see where is that. I'm going to zoom in a minute. Uh, where is that? Object pool. OK. How I can zoom? Yeah. What do you have here? So as you can see here, the key is just an integer. I try to, to not use strings. I try to use the things that take a little bit more or less memory. Right after that, I have a array stack. And I am also initialize the objects, put them inside the pool. So for every type of the object, I have an array stack. And basically, take the data from the array stack, Use it and just get rid of it when I'm done with that. OK, so inside the get method, what I'm doing here, basically take the type of the object that it's required, take the object, get it, use them, return back. How I'm doing that really, it's basically in that main method. I first uh, do initialization. Basically, I have a way to configure how many objects it's required to be created for me. So for direct order, it's basically that. For direct bu bucket, it's something like that. And when I create the object, the object is already there. It's already created for me. And let's try to zoom that. Mm. Yeah, probably it's not possible, but let's try. Mm. OK, here I have only two objects. Basically, that's my types, the first one and the second one, and the object's there. If I need to reuse the object, I can create them and fulfill those maps in the beginning of the application. Right after that, the date is already initialized for me, and there is no garbage correction. There is no required to do new or something like that. OK, let's move. Thread local. OK, there is still code here. Let's move back to the IntelliJ then. What we are doing here? Let's say that there is a data that is required 
for the entire application, or at least for that thread, we can put that data inside the thread local. This basically means for the entire thread, the data is going to be there. So we don't need to create the objects. We don't need to do any kind of synchronization. The data is going to be inside the thread, and we can reuse it. Uh, let's just run that, run that example to see if it's working or not. I hope it's going to work. Yeah. Welcome to J Prime. And there is two threads. Amazing. Let's move. Singleton. How many of you guys have written Singleton at least one? Okay. How many of you guys are using Singleton in your real applications? Not the Spring, the real Singleton. Without Spring. Okay. And how you do that? Enum. Okay, that is the most easy way, and you get my example, basically. So, yeah, there is the easy way to do a single tennis basically using just an enum. Enum with single value. Who knows why? Yes, exactly. The compiler is going to provide a guarantee that there's going to be only one instance of the instance. So basically, we have a num, and we have a singleton with it. If you want to use it, you can do it in that way. That is the most easy way. There is no synchronization. There is no double synchronization, things like that. Uh, probably in most of the interview, they are asking for something like that. Just use that. There is no reason to not do it. OK, let's move. Why wait? Oh, uh, that's a really interesting pattern. So you can just use that pattern to do something like cache. And basically, it's going to be a constructed design pattern that will all programs to support fast quantity of the object and keeping them in memory with low consumption. OK, amazing. If somebody tried that in the production, how many of you guys uh, know about the pattern like that? Nobody? One, two, three, OK, four. Guys, please send me your CVs. OK. Using primitive type corrections. So most of you know that when we have a correction or something like that, we need to use the wrappers. And this is really bad. Using the wrappers basically means more, more memory. There is basically a reference. There is also out, uh, boxing and unboxing. So if you want to be fast, you need to use the corrections that don't have any kind of uh, reference to them. So do I need to go down by myself? That is a really interesting question. No, I don't try like to write the code by myself. So that is why I'm an architect. So there is a library that could do that for us. The one of the libraries, it's called Agrona. And the second one is Eclipse Correction. So somebody already did that for us, and we can just take it and reuse it. OK, the same slide twice. That is the reason why we don't need to do a representation early in the morning. Right after that, we are going to discuss about thread synchronizations. Let's move to the first slide. Cost of synchronization. When there is a text synchronization, basically means you have a context switching. Your entire cache in L1, L2, or L3 is going to be deleted. And there's not going to be get a new data. And basically slow down your application because as as probably you already don't remember that, but a couple of slides ago, it's basically taking about 60 nanoseconds to take the data from the main memory. It's going to happen if there is a context switching. So we need to just don't do that. Also, there is a walk, uh, there is a walk, basically the object walk and things like that. It's not going to be so cost efficient. Okay, avoiding synchronization. How you can do that? There is Basically, two ways to do that. The first one is thread local. We already saw the example like for that. And there is a cast based alternatives. Probably most of you are using something like atomic integer or things like that. Those, primit those objects are using cast based alternatives. If they are good, mm, really depends. They basically represent the problem in a different way. There is two synchronization or something like synchronization, but in the, a little bit more different way. OK, thread local variable, we already saw that. I'm going to move to the next part. Cast-based alternatives, atomic integer, 
do operation, there is a guarantee. Amazing. False sharing. That is really interesting. What is that? Basically, when there is two cores and two threads of them, they have a cache. And when they read the data from the main memory, they're taking that data from the, from the main memory, put it inside the cache, and do some kind of operations. When there is the false, sh false sharing, this basically means that two threads are trying to get the same data from the main memory and put it in the error pool cache. And that was one of the reasons why uh, there is going to be a swap, because you need to clean the cache, and basically you can read the wrong data, and the next cycle is going to take the new data, and things like that. How are you going to solve that? There is a couple of ways. The one way is just to add uh, padding. And when you add the padding, you're basically moving the data and provide a guarantee that it's not going to be fetched from the main memory because you already reserved that data for you. There is a notation as well who can do a padding, who do a padding. That is the one way. There is a notation. And you need to know what the architecture of your uh, CPU is. Depend on the architecture of the CPU, the padding is going to be different. So you need to know your CPU as well in order to understand how you can do that. OK, thread affinity. Now we speak about how you can put the data inside the thread worker, uh, how we're going to work with that. Do we really need to have a complex switching? Can we just get a thread and bind it to the CPU and just say, OK, everything is going to run on that processor. It's not going to be for everything else. We can do that. Let's see how we can do that. OK, uh, where is that? Thread affinity example. OK, what we are doing here, first, we are getting the available processors. Right after that, we just use uh, affinity walk. It's basically come from the library called OpenHFT affinity, and we can require core. This basically means that that core is going to be walked for that thread. OK, and we do some work. And after that, we can finish and see the main thread. Let's try it. As you can see here, the worker thread is working in the CPU 1, and the main thread is CPU 0, and I have a little bit more available. OK. So what else I can do here? Let's see. I can acquire a walk, I can, I can acquire a core, I can do a lot of things basically. But if I put my thread to be executed only in that core, this basically means that I'm not going to have a context switching because the, the core is reserved for that thread. Probably you're thinking how that's going to work in the Kubernetes. It's a little bit different. You need to touch, a little, you need to touch the, the kernel of the node in order to make that possible. But yeah, it's possible. Okay. Let's move. LMAX distributor. That is the most interesting part, actually. So what that really give to us? Uh, in the LMAX distributor, there is a high-performance inter-thread messaging library. You basically have one thread and put the data there. There is a thread that could, could consume that data. And it's really, really fast. It's basically non-blocking. You can do almost everything there. And the best architecture of that, you have a producer. You can have one or more producers. There is a sequence that provides you a guarantee uh, about your messages. And also, there is a sequence barrier, basically describe what should be do when you, there is no messages, and a couple of event handlers. And if you describe your chain of event handlers, you can basically do everything. So currently, we're designing a system for feature flag that is going to use the LMAX in order to provide us uh, our low latency and high throughput. So that is the most easy way how you can do something like that in Java. When you fill the, the ring buffer, is that right? The data there is already populated for you. So there is no reservation. The reservation happens when we initialize it. When the application starts, the data is there. Also, there is a ring. You have two counters. The first one is the counter when you write the data, and the second counter is where your consumers are where your event handlers are. OK, let's move to the previous slide. 
and speak a little bit more about the distributor. So you can have a multicast. Basically, you can have more producers than consumers. How that is going to work, for example, if you have a Kafka and you have a couple of threads, you can take the data from the Kafka and just put it there. When the data inside the distributor, there is a guarantee that you can process it in order that it's arrived in the distributor. The data is already pre-allocated. There is no work there. There is a couple of strategies that basically describe what the threads that for the consumers is going to do. There is a busy core. There is a couple of more. Basically, there is a thread that do nothing. And when the data is available, just take the data, do a work, and put it to the next, um, next event handler. OK, let's look at the example. What we have here, actually, we have a buffer size. And we have a strategy described how the thread should be created. And currently, I'm using the default one. Also, here is my event handler. Basically, I'm going to print the, the events. Also, I'm getting the ring buffer. And basically, I'm publishing the data inside the ring buffer. And that's it. If you create more event handlers here, they're going to be executed sequentially. And you, here you can do everything with the data, everything that is available from those commands. Here you can match your orders. Here you can do a risk engines, evaluate your feature flags, or everything you want. The entire logic, the entire business logic, should be handled inside the handle event methods. You can change them as well. Let's try to use that with. Here is basically two. Let's see what's going to happen. Is that going to crash my laptop? Hopefully, no. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, I'm able to produce a lot of messages really fast. And the reason why it's so slow, basically, on the screen is basically because the C out. If I'm removing the C out because it's blocking operation, it's going to be much faster than that. OK, let's move. The next one, Honeycomb app. How many of you have? Cache inside your application without threads, without tools like that, just in memory cache. OK? How do you do that? Hash map? Concurrent hash map? OK. There is a, a, another way. You can use the rivalry code Chronicle map. And the big difference here is that the Chronicle map can share the data between the different GVMs if they are running in the same container or the same machine. But you can use the disk, not the RAM. Basically, the data is off heap. You can persist the data to the disk, and some other process can take the data and use it. OK, let's look at the example about the Chronicle map. Where is that? OK, it's here. What I'm doing here, it's a rivalry. What I'm saying, this is the, my uh, key. Here, I'm not using a string. I'm using char sequence. I don't want to use strings. If you want to go with low rate system, please don't use strings. Just use the char sequence. I'm saying uh, the name of the map, also how many entries I'm expecting to have in the map, and also average value. Why I need to say the average value? This is because, this is because the rivalry is going to use that to calculate how much bytes need to prefetch for me, to allocate for me. And try right after that, I can just insert the data and fetch it really fast. And I don't care about the heap. It's working out of heap. So it's amazing. Let's run the example. It's not working. That's not expected. Ah. Uh, No, I need to just, uh, it's not there. Uh. Anyway, I'm not going to find the GVM options, but doesn't really matter. Let's move. OK, use cases. Real-time trading systems, high concurrency systems. If you want to be really fast, the best way is just to use something like that. Honeycomb Q. 
couple of months ago, I read the article that the Chronicle Q is faster than Java. That was the one of the reasons why I say in the one of the presentation here in software that I'm not going to speak about the Kafka anymore. Because there is alternative that is going to be fast than Kafka. So based on that, they can press a lot of messages with less uh, latency. As you can see here, they're going to process in the P99 through the message around those bytes for less than six nanoseconds. It's amazing. So can you use the real, real applications? Really depends. If you're using the open source, open source library, you need to run in the same machine. But if you want to run it in the multi-machine mode, you need to just go and use the enterprise one. Do we plan to use something like that? Probably, yes. It's brokerless. There is no overhead of brokers. It's running in your machine. So it, yeah, it's pretty good. Let's see how we're going to use that and probably try to run it. It's working last time. Let's see. No, the same problem. Let's try to figure out how to fix that. And yeah. Let's try to open chat GPT. Probably it's going to help us. How to fix. Okay. Writing. Writing. It's there. Uh, the main problem with those libraries is that they are not working with the latest Java versions. So, yeah. That is the main problem with all those libraries. Well, let's see. Is that going to make magic? Something else is not working. What is that? There is one more thing that I need to add there. Okay. Probably this is going to be the last one, I hope. Mm. And what was that? Some new. Okay, let's see. No, still it's not working. Probably it's not going to work. Any case, uh, what else? Is there something else? Let's try to answer the question at the beginning of the presentation. Is Java a good choice for low latency systems? Based on the experience that I have for the last two years, the question is yes. It's good for low latency systems, and you can use it. Many crypto exchanges are basically using Java for all of the data. So you cannot imagine how much data is there, but yeah, they're using Java. But there are different technologies for low latency systems. There is a broker that basically designed for working with low latency data. You cannot just use the JSON. JSON is not good enough. There is many libraries that could deserialize, deserialize data faster than Jackson. You can use the Chronicle wire. There is a couple of more libraries that is basically going to deserialize the data faster than Jackson. But do you really need to use JSON? If you want to go with low latency systems, the correct answer is no. Please don't use uh, JSON. OK, some res resources. From this talk is prepared basically from all of those links. There is an amazing book for Java performance, the second edition. There is a couple of articles in the Chronicle website in which you can learn uh, why you need to ping your uh, thread to the CPU. Also, there is an article about Java is very fast. And inside that article, they're going to speak about why you don't need to create too many objects. There is uh, some kind of optimizations and two really good uh, YouTube actions. So thank you, guys. <laughs>